Okay, so welcome everyone to our workshop. So I'm Rebecca Goodchild. I'm a librarian here at Sacramento City College, and I'm also a City College Union rep. Belinda, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Belinda Lum. I'm SCC's uh, LRCFT president and the union's chief negotiator, um, and we'll be co-presenting with Rebecca today. So, Cool. And Michael, you want to quickly introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Michael Henderson. I'm staff for the union, the executive director. I'm I'm not a faculty member. I, I work for the union and for all of you folks. So nice to see you all here today. All right, great. Okay, so I always find it tricky to do the slideshow well on Zoom, but we're going to give it a shot. Okay. Okay, is this, can everyone see it correctly? All right, looks all right. No, actually we're seeing your other, we're seeing your speaker screen. Okay, let's uh, stop that and try it again. Okay, let's try that one. How's that? Good. Yep. Ah, okay, excellent, yes. All right, let me know if it goes awry at any point. Okay, so here's the uh, quick agenda for today. Um, again, you'll be provided with all these slides um, by email, um, and then Belinda's put them in the uh, chat as well. So just a few things that we're gonna cover here, uh, you know, responsibilities, timelines, some of the documents you have to submit, uh, preemptory challenge, submits, accessibility, and then lots of question and answer period of time. Okay, so we're gonna actually um, read this to you. I know it'll be the only slide that I plan to read the entire thing to you, but it is the purpose of performance review just so we have a clear basis of where we're started. So the primary goal of faculty performance review is to improve the quality of the educational program. The process should promote professionalism, encourage reflection, enhance performance, and be effective in yielding a genuinely useful and substantive, uh, substantive assessment of performance. To achieve this goal, it is necessary to identify, recognize, and nurture excellence, to identify standard performance, to encourage regular and substantive faculty-student interaction, and to indicate areas where improvement is necessary or desirable. While formal performance review as described in this article occurs on a cyclical basis, informal review by colleagues and supervisors occurs on a continuous basis, and as such, communication should also be continuous. Uh, this is directly out of the contract. Um, it is section 8.1 of the contract. Um, basically, we want to be awesome teachers and support our colleagues in doing so. So some of the uh, responsibilities of faculty under review. Okay, so these are basically turning in things when you need to, going to meetings, trying to be as available and communicative as possible, um, kind, thoughtful, all the things I'm sure all of you are already doing. Okay. For faculty reviewers, um, so the big one is confidentiality. Um, you don't wanna talk about the process with people outside of your team. You wanna keep it um, as private as possible so that it, it can be fair for the person that you're reviewing. Okay, there needs to be clarity about what you are allowed to review, which we're going to go over in, in a bit more detail uh, throughout this presentation. Um, you need to, you know, provide your dean with the evaluation in a timely manner. So basically the same thing as the faculty under review, you need to do your homework, turn it in on time. Okay. Um, and then if you have any recommendations, um, that especially for uh, less than satisfactory, you need to provide evidence for that. So if you have a strong suspicion of something or you, you need to actually back that up with evidence. So just uh, keep that in mind. If there's something that you feel is strongly about bringing forward, you just, you need to have evidence. Okay. Uh, there's a difference between a recommendation versus a suggestion. So a recommendation is official thing that someone has to address in their next review. Um, and a uh, suggestion is just like a tip or something that they could work on, things that they could improve upon, but are not like official, you know, red alert, you need to do something about this thing. Okay. And then most important, of course, is adhering to the LRCFT collective bargaining agreement, which outlines all of the rules for this process, which we will continue to go into more detail about. All right, so the timelines, um, we're not gonna go on a uh, point by point 
basis on this, but we've put um, on this slide where you can find the timeline calendar of expe expectations. It's basically when your dean is going to tell you, hey, um, you need to meet uh, for the pre-performance pre review, um, and then when people are going to do workstation observations, when all your stuff is due, all, the, all your homework, what weeks that is due. So if you have questions about that, you can, of course, ask us, but you can go review those in the contract. All right, know your rights. You're going to see, see KYR a lot. This is um, our attempt to help you feel empowered with awesomeness and all the things you um, can do for this review cycle. So you need to know what you need to turn in. You need to know what your homework is. So we have a self-study. Um, you are required to respond to recommendations only from your previous cycle if you've been reviewed before, for, like if you're a tenure track um, person or you're in your second, third, fourth year as, um, or even an adjunct. If you have any recommendations, you need to address those. Okay? You do not have to address suggestions in the self-study. Okay. The equity reflection, so you have to do it, um, but it cannot be used in the peer uh, review uh, process. Uh, so basically a team can read read it, um, reflect on it, maybe discuss things with with you about it, but they cannot use it as part of um, the, re the review. It just needs to be there essentially. Both of those need to be completed and emailed to your dean by the end of week six. So this is week three, I believe. So you got three more weeks to go. Okay, student reviews. Okay, so um, it is past week two. So if you have not talked to your dean, they are defaulted already to online reviews only. Um, if you wanted in-person reviews, then hopefully you um, talk to your dean about that and have uh, received in-person reviews um, as well as online ones. So just to know that maybe next time if you really don't want online reviews um, or, you, or you do just want in-person reviews, I believe uh, for those classes, you'd have to ask really early in the review process. Okay, so student reviews uh, taken alone may not lead to a less than satisfactory review. So um, if you look at the student reviews, they uh, there was a bad day, they said some crazy stuff, um, they can't use that alone as a way to give you less than satisfactory. However, if there are um, things in the student review that substantiate some of your observations from the workspace, uh, sorry, workstation review, um, or there's some kind of other complaint or investigation going on that is also reflected in the student reviews, they can be used as evidence. Okay, so again, alone, by themselves alone, they cannot be um, used for a less than satisfactory review. All right, Belinda. We will switch off now. So um, one thing to note is that um, tenure, uh, that tenure track, tenure faculty and part-time faculty as, um, have uh, what we call a peremptory challenge where you are allowed to remove um, a faculty reviewer from your team. You cannot remove your dean. Um, let me just preempt the question that often comes up here. Um, but there are um, but there are very specific rules that change based on the category you're in. So if you are a tenure track faculty member, um, you can use your uh, peremptory review only once during years two through four. <clears throat> um, as I noted, you can only use it to remove a faculty member. So when you want to remove the faculty member from your team, you email your, your campus's academic senate president. Uh, so for um, Sacramento City College, it's Sandra Guzman. For uh, FLC, it's Eric Wada. From uh, Consumers River College, it's Jacob. And I just forgot his last name, but we'll get it to you. We'll put that on the info sheet. And then uh, American River College, it's Brian Knurk. Um, but you would email the Academic Senate President directly, and you actually do not need to give a reason for why you're removing the faculty member. All you need to write is, I wish to exercise uh, my peremptory challenge and remove, and then put their name from my committee. Um, and so um, you can exercise the peremptory challenge um, after th within three weeks of being notified by the Academic Senate President's approval of the peer review team. So what's been happening literally probably over last week and this week or the end of this week, the Senate presidents, um, the Senate presidents have been approving the committees and then you were notified, should be notified by your dean. 
Um, the, so that's when the clock starts. Some deans historically have tried to start, start have tried to start the clock when they tell you who your team is before the Senate president's approval. That is not correct. The clock starts when the Senate president approves. Um, also note that when you exercise your peremptory challenge, um, it is the Senate president's job in consultation, usually with the dean and or chair, although they, it's just a recommendation and a consultation to replace the member. So note that, um, that the Senate president is not under any contractual obligation to use um, the suggestions, but they will consult. And then finally, um, what's important to note, because I know that we have a lot of folks here, I just was eyeballing the participants here, um, who are long-term uh, temps, LTTs, um, and then tenure track faculty in their very first year, you cannot exercise a challenge. Um, so you do not have a peremptory challenge in your first year. Um, so those are the conditions for the tenure track faculty. If you can forward uh, to the next slide for me, Rebecca. For tenured faculty, after you receive tenure, you're then reviewed every three years unless you um, uh, are, uh, unless your committee has come back with an off cycle review, um, saying that we believe in a year you need to be reviewed as one of the recommendations, or if you are subject to a special review. Um, but basically the majority of our faculty undergo um, a procedure A or B review. And your first one after your tenured is a procedure A, which means you do the full review with your self-study, classroom observation, equity reflection, et cetera. Procedure B um, still requires the documents but no classroom observations. Uh, but te tenured faculty can use their peremptory challenge during every review cycle. And again, the process is the same. You email the Senate president, um, the Senate president replaces the removed faculty mm -hmm. member, and this must be exercised within three weeks of being notified that by the academic Senate president. Um, go ahead to the next slide for me. Oh, part-time, you already, uh, for part-time faculty, and this is a new, um, this is new to our contract. So this was something that was newly negotiated uh, by our team this last spring. Um, part-time faculty now have, uh, part-time faculty cannot use their peremptory challenge during the very first review, which means if you are a new part-timer, uh, you, you don't have a challenge. However, um, after that first review, part-time faculty can use their peremptory challenge during all other review cycles. Um, part-time faculty are reviewed every three years. Um, and you should note that that three-year clock is based on the campus. So if you are a part-time faculty member that uh, hypothetically started at Sacramento City College in 2022, um, and you go up for review in 2025, um, and then you started in 2023 at American River College, your ARC clock starts in 2023. Um, so these are, uh, just note that you may be on multiple different calendars if you are a part-time faculty member and you should ask your area dean when you're scheduled for review. Um, when part-time faculty exercise their peremptory challenge, the process is again, the same as the other two categories. You email your Senate president, the Senate president replaces the room faculty member, um, and it can be exercised only within the first, the three weeks of being notified of the Senate president's approval of the review team. These timelines are really important. Um, you cannot exercise it after the fact. And, um, and again, um, the only other way in which um, folks have been removed outside of a peremptory challenge is with demonstrated evidence of bias. Um, that is written in our performance review, Article 8, and the threshold to prove that is actually relatively steep. Um, but if you believe that you are facing those types, of, some sort of bias or discrimination, you should contact your, um, your campus president to discuss that as soon as possible. Um, are there any questions, Michael, that we need to answer in the chat? I've I've answered a couple uh, uh, in the chat itself. One about special reviews. I noted that they are very unusual, but anyone who has one has to be informed about it beforehand. Um, and one about the rule regarding only, uh, allowing uh, student uh, evaluations only as um, if it's corroborated by other evidence. That is, that's a Los Rios thing, something we've negotiated. The education code does require student evaluations as part of, part of faculty performance review, but exactly 
how student reviews work is negotiated at the local level by individual districts. Um, and someone's just asked, when did the peremptory clause begin for adjuncts? We're happy to announce we just negotiated that in the most recent round of negotiations. In fact, this is the sem first semester, Michelle, that it's in effect. Um, as of right now, we do not, ha I uh, do not, uh, Michael, do you remember, I don't think you would add a part-time faculty member to the review no, team. No, you, you can't request anyone specific. You can, you can uh, remove somebody, but you can't determine who the replacement is. Um, just one thing on the peremptory challenges too, it sort of occurred to me recently that we might want to talk with the district next, next time around about peremptory challenges and LTTs, because given that peremptory challenges are designed to sort of be a, a sort of an escape valve for pre-existing tensions, the fact that so many LTTs come from our part-time ranks means that maybe they should have a right to a peremptory challenge too, but they do not currently, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I agree. And I would also say that the current circumstances that we've been in in the last three years We've had a ridiculously high number of long-term temps. Um, as I noted, we have 52 across the district this semester. Um, normally, it used to just be like one per campus in a given semester, and normally just to replace like if someone went on a sabbatical or someone went on leave. This is really an unusually high number in that the majority of them are to meet um, enrollment needs. So this is kind of a new dynamic. And so it's it's created the necessity, as Michael noted, for us to uh, go back to the drawing board a little bit for LTTs. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, the reviewers, um, but uh, I, but my, but my, going back to Julie's question, is that currently under the contract, uh, uh, it is a full-time faculty member that reviews. Um, I don't, we had tried to get a preferenced uh, part-time faculty member in, but I think, I believe we were unsuccessful this last time, Michael, if I remember right. Yeah, that's right. And so really it's the full-time faculty who, who are reviewing. Um, and so, uh, uh, but it's not for lack of trying um, in trying to negotiate that. So it is a full-time faculty member that reviews. And the difference for between part-time and full-time is that part-time faculty only have one faculty reviewer. Um, you have two faculty reviewers in tenure track and LTT reviews. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Can we um, go to the next slide? So oh, workstation. Oh, oh, Belinda, oh, sorry, can I, can I just say so? I, there, there's nothing actually prohibiting an adjunct from being a reviewer, um, but, but we can't demand one and the contract doesn't mandate one. Thank you. Perfect. So, um, so in terms of workstation reviews, it must follow the rules as listed in the contract. And I think that there are a few things that are important to note here. Um, and I'm gonna try to scroll back to uh, Heike's question as well a little bit earlier here. Um, but in terms of the workstation reviews, um, the, for instructional faculty um, is conducted between week six and 15. Um, it, should, it should be noted that um, uh, the, the dates need to be mutually agreed upon. So in your pre-meeting, and I believe someone had emailed me a question about this, in your pre-meeting with your, your dean and your team, um, they typically establish the dates that you want to have to be reviewed. Um, everyone does it slightly differently. So I just want to note that. So some folks, some deans will say, hey, Belinda, arrange with... Um, you know, with Nick Miller for when he's going to come into your um, into your classroom, pick the date and be very clear and send me the date. Um, others, other deans are much more. I'm going to call it prescriptive, but um, and and how it actually runs in my division is okay. Belinda and Nick, pull out your calendars during this pre meeting. Choose the date in which uh, Nick will come into your class and review you. So one of the suggestions I have for the pre meeting for everybody is that you should take a look at your syllabus. Um, and this is for both online and in-person um, workstation reviews, and pick what you think is going to be the demonstration of your best work. So I, I know um, a lot of us have an understanding of there are particular lectures that we do or particular lessons that we do that show off our best qualities. My, my recommendation is to have is to schedule your review, your workstation reviews around those three, four, or five types of lectures that you give. Um, some of you are uniformly great across the board, and so you can pick any day and it's fine, but 
Um, but it, you, it, the dates are mutually agreed upon. So it could be, and it always happens between six and 15. <clears throat> Traditionally speaking, most of us will not schedule um, during the week of midterms, or if you know you're gonna be giving a midterm back, sometimes we give a little space there, but you do have some autonomy to say yes or no. They can't just say, I can't just say, hey, Rebecca, I'm coming on September 16th, be ready. It needs to be mutually agreed upon. Um, in terms of online reviews uh, for Canvas, the reviewer, uh, they are added in the reviewer role um, in Canvas for uh, seven days, right? This Again, this is a mutually agreed upon time period and the reviewers are responsible for only reviewing um, the week or the module that you're teaching that week. They cannot, uh, and, and then the, that, and then any, I would say any public facing type of um, announcements or your syllabus, which you would have already sent them your syllabus anyways. So they cannot go see everything in the kitchen sink as my predecessor, Kaylee, uh, Casey Boylan used to say, they are supposed to say confined to your uh, module for that week. If comments come up in your review, from outside that week, you should contact your union president or union rep. But this is something that we would have removed or question the veracity of why it's there. Um, if it's associated, if their comments are associated specifically with the syllabus, that's fair game. But if, it, if they're saying it's part of your workstation review and, and that you they looked at weeks two, 12 and, whatever, and 13, that is not okay. Um, for, um, for hybrid classes, um, there is some flexibility here. And I, I think that it's um, it's often best to um, schedule it relative to um, kind of your uh, pedagogical approach to teaching. So for example, um, one of my colleagues in chemistry uses what we call a flipped classroom model. And so all the lectures are online and her in-person part is more kind of study session and less a demonstration of her teaching. In that particular case, it may make most sense for her, again, to follow the online Canvas for seven days observation um, so that they can get an understanding of her content expertise, et cetera, and follow the online rules. However, if you are someone who may reverse that and do a lot of lecture in your class on the one day you're in person, and then there's more discussion online, what you may want to do is have them come to the in-person and if you and if you feel it's necessary, you can provide samples of what the students do to respond. So there is some flexibility, and I we highly recommend that you um, that you discuss this in your pre meeting. And it, and again, it should be mutually agreed upon. There should be no surprises. Um, they can't just demand one or another, but there should be some uh, discussion as to why. And I and I would tell you that it should always be affiliated with um, your particular approach. Um, well, Linda, think, just yes. just a couple of questions have come up, um, our, and I, I want I'd like you to confirm this. Walter asks asked um, reviewers only see what students see, right? And I've said yes, that's our intention, but it's not always been quite that way in practice, right? Uh, not necessarily. So for some of us in Canvas, we um, we use uh, small groups, like we have group sections. And if you're in a student role, you can't bounce from group to group. So they have a specific role that's called reviewer. They're able to move from group to group if you have small groups set up. Um, they're not able to see anything that's not published, but they will be able to see anything that's published. Um, so if they come in in week seven, they could potentially see one weeks one through six. Some of my colleagues, I'm gonna say, depending on the politics of their department, some of them have no problem leaving all of their modules open and with the understanding that they should only be looking at week seven. Others, because let's just say it's a more acrimonious environment, have opted to, to unpublish all the weeks before um, and only have published the week under review. That is completely your decision as the faculty member as to how comfortable you feel leaving everything open or not. But your only contractual obligation is to show the week under review. But they are, like I said, depending on how you have your Canvas set up, 
they they may they can bounce back and forth between things. They will not be able to see grades. Um, they will look at discussion boards. They may also be able to look at assignments. But uh, and again, it depends on the setup within Canvas. Um, also, there, there, Stacey asked about uh, how off, how many classes are reviewed, and she was asking about student reviews and workstation observations. That varies a little bit between the different three three classes of faculty. Uh, for example, um, with workstation observations for tenure track, there have to be a minimum of three different three direct workstation observations, and the idea, where possible, is that they should include different types of course preparation um, and for the tenure track student reviews in a minimum of three classes and for all types of faculty student reviews should be done one one for each class preparation wherever that's practicable um, and I, just as a general recommendation here I know that some some faculty avoid it like the play because it's incredibly boring to read and I understand that but it is a good idea to read the relevant section of the contract for your review uh, so and it's just one part of one article so 8.6 for tenure track 8.7 for tenured 8.8 .8 for adjunct um, it's fairly straightforward language and yeah I, I i highly recommend anyone being reviewed to read the relevant section even if you've been to this workshop one thing i do want to note in this is um and i think for part-time faculty it's usually one class uh, like one of your assignments and for full-time faculty it should be your um it should be your classes that are in load so not your overload but your in load classes this is for instructional faculty um I think it's also important to note, again, it's mutually agreed upon. Um, we've had inst instances where um, a faculty reviewer wanted to do over because they didn't see something specific. It is again, not allowable by contract. But I would also just tell you if some part of your instincts are telling you this doesn't feel right, contact one of your union reps so that we can try to get the answer for you. Don't suffer in silence. It's really the only way that we can enforce the contract is if we know what's happening. Um, with counselors, coordinators, and librarians, um, they're, they're, uh, if you are working any portion of your load remote, um, you will, one of your, part of your workstation evaluation may be, uh, actually should be, um, your sessions that you do remotely. Now, it's going to look different for librarians, so they may be working a virtual desk, right? And, and I'm going to let Rebecca talk about librarians because I'm making things up and she knows it. Um, but for counselors, exam for example, um, before the appointment, they would usually tell somebody, um, you know, I'm under a, a review and, um, you know, Michael's in, will be in our session today. Is that okay? If the student says no, then the person, the reviewer would exit. But it also, again, this is again, it has, with the counselors, it's a little bit different uh, in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the privacy, uh, FERPA, all the different laws um, there. Um, for uh, coordinators, again, coordinators is sort of this bucket <laughs> um, that has a lot of different types of, of coordinators. Um, so we have counseling coordinators. So you may be evaluated both in terms of your counseling side and also be asked about the coordination work you do. We have some coordinators that I think I saw Brian Pogue in the room um, who do a lot of um, kind of different online work. So the observations of your workstation should again be about a specific work product. Um, it could also be about particular, it could be a particular set of interactions or um, a training session that you do, but again, mutually agreed upon ahead of time. Um, did I catch most of the questions there in terms of the workstation reviews? Yeah, I think we're, I think you're good now. Okay, well we go to the next one, and there's there's time for questions at the end as it comes up as well. So, okay, uh, as you, yeah. <laughs> okay, no worries. Okay, so common misconceptions. Um, Reviewers can come into your class, works observation whenever they want. Again, no, it must be a mutually agreed upon time and date. If anyone just checks into your class, please let your union rep know. Okay, if you're surprised, there's something wrong. Okay, um, myths two, reviewers can opt to do more than one workstation review if they didn't see anything they want. Again, no, it has to be um, by, they have to agree upon it with you. Uh, you, you cannot go hunting for what you wanna see. And then myth three, in an online Canvas review, the reviewer can see all of your 
class modules. So again, um, no, the contract only allows reviewers to look at the week under review and the public facing pages. So the publish, published pages in Canvas. Okay. Uh, faculty under review should remove the reviewer when the seven day period expires. Um, yeah, pretty clear, I think. All right, so let's let's talk about let's talk accessibility. Number um, there's been a lot of questions about what is and is not allowed around accessibility um, in a faculty uh, review. Um, so first and foremost um, is, is that faculty have the professional obligation to meet student accommodations that have through that have been noted in the faculty notification letter that is supplied by DSPS. Um, for those of us who are instructional faculty, it's largely been emailed to us. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we used to get the letter with the blue, it used to be a blue cover letter over at City College, but it very explicitly states that student X needs two times or double the time on quizzes or may need to record your lecture. We must comply with those letters and it is part of our professional obligations. Now, that being said, um, we, ha um, we have an accessibility committee that worked throughout the summer and even last spring. Um, and what we've been seeing across the district is what we consider to be a broad scale overreach um, of what is being evaluated. And this is occurring for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's happening, I think, because some folks don't understand spe what specifically you can be uh, evaluated in terms of accessibility. Some folks have been giving their own interpretations, but I'll go through some of that. Faculty members may not give recommendations and or rankings of less than satisfactory for general accessibility work for in-person or online classes. So for example, they cannot say you are required to caption, closed caption, your lecture. They cannot say you um, used, uh, you know, you, you used the wrong font and, and you must change it. All of those are not allowable on your review. And if it comes up, you should immediately uh, send the review over to the union presidents. Can we go to the next slide? I think we have a, have a little bit more on accessibility there. Um, so some areas where we've seen the overreach happen tends to be in very, is in the evaluation of three very specific articles. Um, and there's, uh, we're using the ones right now or the, for the, Tenure, I think 8.4 8. is uh, our tenure, our pre-tenure faculty, but it, it the, 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 what do you call it? Um, it may be slightly differently numbered based on being coordinator or, uh, you know, or a counselor or a tenured faculty, but the language is the same. Um, some have falsely interpreted 8.4.1.3, adjusts methodologies for students with diverse and or special needs and or different learning styles to be an accessibility standard. This is not true. Um, accessibility is not a methodology, right? It's not a style of teaching. It is not a way in which we uh, choose to um, present, uh, you know, choose to present uh, scholarly information. And so by extension, an individual cannot be negatively evaluated for accessibility under this article. Um, this analysis also applies to 8415, interacts with students and colleagues across employee groups with dignity and respect, or 8416 promotes an inclusive classroom uh, or workplace environment that is free from harassment, prejudice, or bias. So these particular articles, right, it is not up for the faculty, for faculty reviewers or deans who are reviewing to spin it to meet their needs. These are meant to measure very specific things like interactions. Like if, you, if you've been going around the hallways making very um, sexist remarks, then you should be written up under um, you know, 8415. Um, same thing with 8416. Um, in terms, if you've mistreated your admin assistant, um, again, 8415, this is not meant for loose interpretation. If you receive comments on accessibility, um, these types of comments on accessibility. So sometimes um, sometimes it'll just come up under recommendations without a less than satisfactory ranking on anything. So if it just comes up in your recommendation section, um, you should contact your campus union president as soon as possible. Um, we've been uh, in a loose uh, in a loose survey that was done by the union last spring. Um, of those who responded, it looked like one in five folks received these types of remarks that are not allowed on review. 
Um, our intention is that we will we will be grieving it across the district to make sure that this doesn't continue because it is um, outside the scope of the contract. Um, I think next slide. I think it's you. <laughs> Can I have a quick question? Can uh, the recommendation tell you to use like focus mode on Zoom or uh, can the recommendation be like, um, like, okay, so recommend you to record the lecture or use focus mode on Zoom? Uh, no, I mean, you're not under, I guess the thing is, is, is that uh, it, it shouldn't, I think they could suggest what mode you use on that. I'm unclear why they're telling you to record something. We may need more context and if you want to send that to us. If if it's supposed if it's an asynchronous class, then um, you know, recording it makes sense. If it's a synchronous class, like you're you're online and synchronous, then you're you are not under an obligation to record. So part of it is context. Um, I don't want to just give a uniform answer. So I'll just need more context. And if you type it into the chat, we can probably better um, uh, you know, we can, if you put it in the chat, we could probably better answer that. Um, okay, thank you. I mean, in relation to that question, like, if it's an asynchronous class and I need to record it and post it, then uh, I accidentally, like, didn't put the caption in it, or caption is not, like, 80, 90% above, then is it, like, is part of the evaluation, like, they can say something about it or no? No, they oh. cannot unless unless there was um a, and even then let me let me uh, say this if you have someone in your class right under faculty notification that needs captioning right um it isn't that you, you we have resources that you should send it in for captioning but just to say that you need to caption for the sake of captioning no they cannot put that in in your review but if there somebody need the caption then. It should be there. If someone needs a caption, then it's the institution's responsibility. Right. So you should work with DSPS okay. right, to make sure that you can get um, your uh, materials captioned in a um, timely manner. Okay. Got it. Okay. So if you are a reviewer, things to avoid. Okay, so again, you cannot use perceived lack of general accessibility content for less than satisfactory review. If you go in and they do not have the appropriate captions, uh, they uploaded a PDF that is um, not accessible in Canvas, uh, things of that nature, um, they are not responsible for it in this way. Like you cannot give them a less than satisfactory for that. Again, unless it's a requirement through um, you know, a DSPS letter, in which case you would work with DSPS. Okay, you may not use an ex parte conversation with other faculty members who are not on the review team for less than a satisfactory review. So if you hear some kind of crazy thing about someone, um, even if you believe it, you cannot use it on the review. Um, if they're not part of your review team and you don't have evidence to support it. Okay, you may not violate Article 17, academic freedom. So this, uh, if you don't agree with the, the topic uh, that they or the specific texts, materials, videos they provide, as long as they're meeting the course um, topics and outlines as um, in the curriculum for the class, then they're good to go. They have the choice to pick books and other materials that you may not like. All right, you may not use the equity reflection as part of the review. Again, uh, it's there more to start a discussion. Um, it is not something that you can use as evidence for something less than satisfactory. Okay. Um, you cannot use outside sources like social media to give less than satisfactory marks on an evaluation. It can only be, um, you can only use the workplace observations and um, uh, any of the uh, documents they turn in, like self-study, um, but also not the equity one. <laughs> so just the self-study and the workplace observations. It, okay. it should be, on that last one, I think it's important to note, like, for example, um, if you've can if you've spammed your whole department with problematic emails and you've been told to stop and you continue to do that, right? That may be something that does come up in a review or in your department canvas page. So um, just be aware, right? Um, and um, that 
our emails and our canvas are, are um, the property of Los Rios. And so um, they are workplace tools. Um, in terms of when did the rules on UDL and accessibility begin, um, it's our contention that this, 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 the contract, as it's been written for the last decade, um, that these rules have been in place, but we've just recently, since the pandemic, seen a very big push, right, uh, where we're seeing thing, very problematic things appearing in uh, the performance review. And so uh, the union is take, uh, the union um, and our board, um, I think just even this week, affirmed that we will be taking a much stronger assertive uh, stance on making sure um, that there isn't overreach on accessibility because again, one in five, a one in five reviews having comments that are not contractually valid is a problem. Um, and it's a problem that we are unwilling to let continue to go further. Um, that's not to say that we haven't had a re removed. Uh, so for example, I would tell you that as a union president, for those who brought things to me, um, I would generally, if I was able to, a lot of times I was able to handle it at what we call the informal letter, le informal level, where I would call the dean saying, you know, this isn't allowed, and then they would remove it. But the problem is, is I can only do that for people who notify us, right? And so this is why we're really encouraging folks that if, you, if that something just doesn't feel right on your review, to contact us as soon as possible. Um, and again, you can just feel that it doesn't feel right and we can give you an accurate answer. And I think Michael's going to jump in too. Yeah, I was just going to say, Michelle, um, there's no specifically new rules on UDL and accessibility per se. There, there are some uh, possibly, some possibly coming down the pipeline in Title V uh, of uh, the state code, but that's still a ways away yet. And more generally, um, there's a difference too between what, what, policy the college and the district decide to have and what is faculty responsibility and sort of part of our point here as the union too is not at all that we are opposed to the principle of accessibility everybody in the union supports accessibility for students who require it the issue is that it's it often becomes a very significant workload issue and our point is you can't simply foist that onto faculty uh, and add hours a week to their work without us negotiating that. Um, and it could be that some things that the that the college and the district want are actually appropriate. But the question we need to answer with them is who actually does this work? So on that. Is that you, Deborah? Yes. Go for absolutely. It. Oh, sorry, do you have a question there, Deborah, or were you just... No, I just I just wanted to affirm what Michael said. It is yeah. so important. I mean, you know, we we all do the best we can, but quite frankly, there's only, there's only so much, so many hours in the day, so much energy that we can bring to trying to create the best products for our students. Absolutely, thanks. But so. we should never violate the accommodations, of course. Right. We agree. Although I may have done that today. Oh, no. Well, I'll just, I'll <laughs> but but it, sometimes it looks to students like a violation. Look, so let yeah. me get, so maybe this is a good, so I had, uh, I can turn my video on, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I had, a, I gave a quiz today and, um, you know, students are, who have accommodations typically have extra time for stuff. And I gave it in my class and so there was no way to do that. My intention, however, is to give everybody the maximum grade on that quiz, no matter what they did. Right. So it looks to students like so I, said, I brought that student up and said, don't worry, you're going to be happy with this quiz. Although I know you need extra time, you're going to be good. Now, that student right now left a little bit twisted, maybe. Right. But I think she trusts me. And you know, so sometimes you have to be really careful. Right. But we're trying to get the education in without violating students rights. And sometimes it just gets a little messy around the edges. And I think we have to be really aware that we sh that we are not to violate accommodations. Absolutely. And um, I, see, I see an email, can they base a uh, recommend uh, on phone conversation and use it on your recommendations? I think it really depends on the nature of the conversation, who you're having it with, et cetera. And if you have some um, questions about that, I'm gonna recommend that you contact just us directly, myself or Michael or whoever your campus president is, um, so that we can maybe give you more um, personalized feedback. But, you know, um, I don't know. Oops, it, yeah. And so just so you know, um, 
again, we really want to encourage, and the number one thing we want to encourage is, um, even if you just feel some sort of way, or it just doesn't look right to you on the recommend, you know, on the on the form, contact your union president or Michael Henderson, our new-ish executive director. Um, Michael, you only have four more months of using the new title. I, I know, think, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> but all of us will, and you can also copy both Michael and your union president, and whoever gets to the email first will will get to it. But um, there are, like I said. Um, we know that each of you may have very specific circumstances that are unique to you, um, you and your dean or you and your um, department. And so we can best tailor our advice by talking to you directly. Um, and at least all of the campus presidents, just so you know, we are given release time. Um, your union dues pay for our time. So we are happy to schedule appointments, um, or answer emails because that's what your union dollars pay for, right? Are are you you know? And it also if we if we get a head scratcher of a question, and will it also pays for the lawyers that we have to call to make sure that we're on the right side of this and that we give you proper advice. So you know your union dollars you don't always get to see where it goes like overtly, but this is one way one thing I could say, um, your your dollars pay for the time to be able to answer this and make sure we represent your rights correctly. Um, other, why don't we pause the recording there? Uh, because I think sometimes folks may have questions they don't want recorded. Okay. And, and then I would thank, I just want 